everyone for joining our session tonight and i'm your co-host and moderator for the tonight today's session uh, my name is saim safdar and i am a cloud native islamabad community manager so what a cloud native islamabad doing uh, helping people learn cloud native stuff as evolving as as new things come up so what we are trying to do is is to track the cloud native stuffs cloud native stuff and helping people learn what these containers are what the kubernetes is what service meshes are and as the technology progresses we're doing the meetups and we're doing the live session we have webinars we have some podcasts and you can join us on the twitter and linkedin and every social media that we have a show notes available for you tonight as you're watching this from youtube channel so tonight is i'm really excited because for this session i'm use linker day for for a long time will be more than a year right now and is i'm being inspired by its simplicity and having some security built in security and some tremendous stuff you can do with linkerd so i'm really inspired by the beauty and easiness of linkerd so i have this opportunity to meet this guy jason morgan who is a technical evangelist at a point a company who created the linkerd and he tell us how linkerd fit into the cloud native stack how it fit to the service mesh ecosystem what you can do with it and everything and today at the end of the session i think you might be able to figure out the linker day is the go to place for you to uh, to have some devops and some kind of cloud native cloud native tooling if you want that so over to you uh, uh, jason and thanks for having thanks for having in our webinars yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, hey folks, can can y'all hear me all right? Yes, uh, probably. I guess uh, I'm able to hear you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thanks so much for that that introduction. Uh, so um, like you heard, I'm a technical evangelist with Buoyant, and I talk about the. Oh, thank you so much, Magno. Is that how I say? It? Um. Oh, awesome. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you all today about Linkerd. Uh, so just before I get started, this is ideally a really interactive session. So if you want to come off mute and, and ask questions, please do. If you want to put them in the chat, I'll, I'll read them as they pop up. And like this, you know, this next hour is for you. So use the time, you know, however, however you like. Um, and please don't worry about interrupting me at any point. Uh, so let me try and get my clicker working here. So let's talk about what Linkerd, uh, what Linkerd is. Uh, so Linkerd is a service mesh, right? And it was it was built specifically to be uh, very lightweight. That is, not use a ton of compute resources, be really fast, and be really secure, right? It's specifically targeted at Kubernetes, right? So it needs to run in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, it's been adopted by a lot of folks from really big organizations. To, uh, to really small startups, right? So it, it fits a number of different use cases and you can see, see some of our adopters, right? As you, as you look around. Uh, it's been in production for over four years. Uh, we have a Slack channel that is extremely active and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask y'all to, to sign up and join it later. Uh, we're also looking at moving over to Discord. So if you have a strong preference Slack versus Discord, love to hear from you. Um, you know, we've got a lot of GitHub stars, but if, if you're interested, you like the project and you feel like giving a star, that, that's always a nice thing to add in. Uh, we've got over a hundred contributors and we're always looking for more. Uh, I believe the session is being recorded. Is that right? Yes, definitely. Okay, awesome. Um, we've got, uh, we, do, we do weekly edge releases. So that means there's, there's a new edge release of Linkerd at least once a week. Um, and we try and do we try and do quarterly uh, quarterly major releases. Um, so we're we're part of the CNCF. I think we're the the sixth project inside the CNCF. So we've got open governance. You can get involved as much or as little as you like with the project. Uh, now, before I go super far, I'd like to start with kind of what is a service mesh. And I just realized I didn't get notes. So let me pop out my little notes thing. There you go. There we go. No, I'm cheating. Uh, I've got my my service mesh definition. So uh, before I go too far, I just want to talk about like what is a service mesh, right? So a quick definition is a service mesh is a tool 
uh, that controls the interactions between your applications. Right, so so in my example here, I've got I've got three different applications running in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, and I want to I want to control that the interactions by by putting a proxy, right, which we're going to show right here, a proxy beside every one of your your application containers, and and that proxy is going to intercept all the traffic in and out of your um, of your of your application, right, and that that. Those inter interactions between these proxies, uh, we call that the data plane in a service mesh. A service mesh is made up of two major components, a data plane and a control plane. Making sense so far? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, a data plane, just like Kubernetes, so it involves Kubernetes. Um, is it Kubernetes, data plane, and a control plane? I don't know. I don't, I don't know that that's exactly the relationship, but it's not it's not super dissimilar, right? There's yeah yeah well, I guess you'd say that right because the control plane would be your node or your uh, your literal control plane nodes in Kubernetes, and then you've got your worker nodes which do that data work. So yeah, that's a that's a fair comparison. Um, so we've got a control plane uh, which basically sends command and control instructions to the proxies. So it tells them you know how we want how we want the interactions between the apps to go. You know what metrics we want to measure. Uh, anything else that that's important about your control plane. So that's the that's the basic idea of what a service mesh is. And I kind of want to talk about why you might want one. And we're going to go further down this, but I just want to talk about the value pillars of a service mesh. In general, you put like the the things a service mesh gives you into three buckets. We have observability features, things to help you get better insight into what your applications are doing. We have security features, which are things that, to make your environment more secure, help you comply with a particular standard. And we have reliability features, stuff to get you more uptime. And I'm going to talk about all this through the lens of, of Linkerd. Uh, so with observability, right, using Linkerd, apart from, let me just answer this real quick. Uh, apart from sidecar approach, shoot, I lost that chat message. Give me one second. Uh, can we make it a daemon set or injector as a sidecar requires changes to the deployment files? Uh, we don't do it as a da daemon set. Yes, we do have an injector, and I'm going to show you exactly how that works during the demo. Uh, and is it's okay, Rajesh? Is that how I said? Um, awesome. If it's okay, Rajesh, I'm going to we can talk about that when we get to the demo portion. Um, so, so from an observability perspective, we get, uh, we get traffic metrics, what we refer to as, um, what we refer to as, you know, the golden metrics of what's the request rate for a given application of those requests, how are, how many are successful? And then what are the late, like, what's the latency of that application, but not just like the raw latency, but latency by the, uh, by the distribution bucket. So we get what we call P50 latency. P95 or P99. So you can see, you know, from a percentage, where are you at in terms of how slow this, this app is or how fast it is. And you can see it in a lot of different ways, right? So that you can get metrics about your environment. Um, also, hello, is Ismail? Ismail? I hope I, I, I'm sure I said that wrong. I'm really sorry. Um, but, um, but hello, hello, Ismail. Um, you get the ability to look at it in a number of different ways. You also get the ability to inspect in individual requests. So you can do uh, you can do some uh, some deeper diving into what your applications are actually saying to each other. And we'll show how that's useful during that demo. Uh, from a security perspective, you know the big thing that that Linkerd uh, brings to your environment is this concept of cryptographic identity. So. We do MTLS, that's mutual TLS. And so that means that all the conversations between your, your apps are going to be encrypted, right? But, but they won't just be encrypted. We're going to have an identity associated with the app. So when we're, we have that service A, B, and C uh, setup that you saw at the beginning, right? We know, we know that, that the certificate that service A uses uh, proves that it is, in fact, of service A, right? Not someone else impersonating it. So you get encryption and identity, and you get it on by default in a way that's entirely transparent to the users, whether you're the developer whose apps are running in that environment or whether you're the platform engineer 
who's turning it on, right? When, when you set up Linkerd, you just get MTLS right at the gate. Uh, and reliability, right? So, so Linkerd uh, has some things which, which build on top of the native Kubernetes construct. So we do latency aware load balancing. So we use something called uh, exponentially weighted moving average, right? To see as, as we look at sending app or sending traffic from one app to another, instead of just using like a round robin that you get kind of by default in a Kubernetes service, we actually, because we know when, when both sides are matched, because we know how that app is performing, we, we ensure that traffic is going to the appropriate nodes uh, in a way that, that gets you more reliability and keeps your app uh, up and running and moving faster. You also get, uh, you also get retries and, uh, and timeouts, right? So that you, if it's safe, we can retry calls and you can set timeouts on individual comms between apps to ensure that you know, you're not seeing something hang forever. Any questions before I move on? Okay, and like I said earlier, please please do feel free to, to interrupt me at any point. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much, Mohamed. Um, so just go back to the, to the who cares, right? Linkerd exists to give platform owners, so whether that's site reliability engineers, whether that's platform reliability engineers or platform architects, we want to give we want to give those that platform team right and that those application teams the the tools right the observability reliability and security tools they need right to provide the best possible platform for running their applications their their cloud native apps and we want to do it in a way that allows you to give features to your development community or to your organization without having to actually bother developers say hey listen can y'all go turn on MTLS or I need you to put in this, this circuit breaking library, or I need you to, you know, use this particular service discovery client so that we can find, you know, find the different components, right? It, it, Linkerd is there to, like, it, it does solve some technical problems, but it also solves some organizational or social problems, right? It allows you to, to give stuff to the developers, give stuff to everybody on your platform without having to, to interrupt, interrupt those dev teams, interrupt their, their release cycles, um, just kind of get it transparently at no, no additional cost for them. Make sense? Um, awesome. Uh, so let's talk about design principles, right? What are, we, what are we doing with Linkerd, right? And especially how do we contrast that with some of the other things in the space? So Linkerd, there's a lot, there's a lot of noise and a lot of marketing in the service mesh space, right? Linkerd, uh, we think we think it's a very different kind of mesh, right? And the way we do it is we stick to the idea of keep it really simple, right? When you set up Linkerd, when I install Linkerd on a cluster, my cluster still works, my apps still work, I don't lose anything out of the gate, right? Like just out of the box, I can install it, and and I've got a thing that that continues to operate. It's also really lightweight. Right, like every, you know, when you think about it, and, and I think, yeah, Rajesh mentioned it earlier, right? Like if we have one proxy for every single instance of our applications, that can become like a heavy burden in terms of compute in that environment. So that's, that's CPU, that's memory. Uh, Linkerd is built to be extremely lightweight. And, you know, we've got some, you can go look at, uh, at a Kinvoke performance benchmark. And if y'all like, I can send it out. It's a fair bit older. But you can look at performance benchmarks for Linkerd and you'll see that it stacks up really well versus other meshes. Um, it's very simple, right? We want to keep, whenever we add new functionality, we want to ensure that we can do it in a way that keeps the operational complexity very low. And, you know, security can't be a bolt on, right? And it has to stay simple, right? Um, I'll expand on this a little bit more as we go, but our control plane here is written in Golang. Uh, which is a very modern language and native to Kubernetes. But our, our proxy, that data plane, is actually written in a new language called Rust, right? And Rust is an interesting language that I'm going to talk about in a bit more depth. But if you want to, if you want to take a peek, you can head on over to uh, the Linkerd proxy in GitHub and take a look at it. Uh, and then if you're curious, Linkerd actually went through a pretty big transition from Linkerd 1 to Linkerd 2. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons learned that you can read uh, here in a uh, article from one of the founders of Linkerd project. Still good? All right. 
Linkerd architecture. Just take a, a quick look at it. We've got our services. They're, they're all represented by pods. And then each pod or each container gets a sidecar proxy. Right? That sidecar proxy handles all the traffic in between applications, identifies them, and encrypts the traffic, and talks to the control plane. Okay. Uh, in fact, the control plane is about to undergo a big change in 2.10, which we expect there really soon. Uh, but as of right now, uh, the control plane comes with a dashboard, Prometheus, uh, an API, and a CLI. Uh, if you're using an ingress, so if you're using something like Ambassador, a, an Envoy-based Envoy ingress, or Nginx, or uh, traffic, or whatever that may be, you can just plug in your ingress and send traffic into the mesh, and you can actually mesh up that, that ingress. So you get all these good, rich statistics directly from not just your apps, but also the ingress. Um, okay, so diving in, I want to I want to talk a little bit about about this data plane. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, so Linkerd is pretty unique in the service mesh space uh, because Linkerd built their own proxy. So what you're going to see with most service mesh offerings, certainly what you're going to see with Istio, is in order to go faster in terms of feature velocity, they decided to uh, I don't know, Magno. I, I, I assume that they're doing uh, right. So, sorry, let me say this out. Uh, Magno asks if there's any per, any plans to perform a new security audit on Linkerd since the last one was almost two years ago. Uh, I'm not sure. I know the CNCF regularly, uh, that's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, regularly provides uh, new testing and updates. And I'm sure as part of, <clears throat> I'm sure as part of the graduation process, it will undergo another another security audit. So that's my expectation, but I can I can kind of get back to you with more information later if you like. Um, so so just stepping back, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, stepping back, um, you know, Linkerd is kind of unique in 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 that we wrote our own our own proxy, right? And what we did was instead of using a general purpose proxy that had a lot of features, instead we wrote our own we call it a micro proxy. Um, that, that is purpose built to only do the things that our service mesh needs it to do. Only, only do what our control plane needs it to do. Uh, it's, it's extremely secure from our perspective and, and certainly according to our last security audit, which I, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but it, it, anyway, according to our last uh, security audit was, was extremely well done. And by, by writing in Rust, right, we actually get to avoid uh, a lot of the, the memory vulnerabilities you get in C and C++, right? Because of the way Rust compiles. Awesome. Yeah, June 2019. Uh, thank you so much, Magna. Um, it's, it's extremely light and extremely fast. So, uh, you know, looking at, looking at languages that you could use to write a proxy, one of the things that was really important to us was to not use a garbage collected language because that process of garbage collection, um, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Uh, that process of, <clears throat> of garbage collection um, actually slows down the operations of the proxy. So we needed something that ran in native code, but also wanted it to be secure. So Rust was really kind of the only, uh, the only choice. Um, so we say regular third-party security audits. So I'm, I'm hoping there's more than, than that one, but I, again, I don't know for sure. Um, but we're, you know, we're, because we're a CNCF project, we're subject to audits from the CNCF of the actual security of the project. Uh, and it's built on a very modern network stack, right? So I'm, I'm not going to dive into the REST stuff for a lot of reasons, including REST is a fair bit over my head at this point. But you can go check out if you're interested uh, the Tokyo Library, Hyper, H2, or Tower to get a sense of what really interesting things are happening in the networking space in REST. Um, it's fully open source, and you can find it on GitHub. And then if you're curious for kind of a bigger justification of you know, why Linkerd chose to write their own proxy. Uh, one of our founders wrote an article on, uh, on, uh, on why, why we chose to do that instead of using Envoy. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, just to add on here, give me one sec. Um, so, so Linkerd was built uh, with this idea of zero trust security. Uh, now, Going back, right? We've got we've got a situation where you're pairing a an instance of the proxy 
with every single one of your applications. And anytime you add in new software, it's, it's really easy to introduce new vulnerabilities. So our, our kind of guiding principles as we built Linkerd was to start out by, you know, not, not adding new vulnerabilities into the environment, right? Um, you know, and we, we did that, or we chose to do that by, by sticking with a language that didn't, that didn't introduce, you know, uh, memory-based uh, vulnerabilities into the environment, which is why we went with, why we went with Rust. On top of that, right, like there's some security in the code, right? So simple code uh, with with a, a secure language is a, is a good start, but you also have things like, you know, complexity, like the more complex your system is, the easier it is to misconfigure, right? Uh, so, so Linkerd went with a choice of using Kubernetes primitives as much as possible. That's why when you install, when you install uh, Linkerd, you see that you only actually add in two new custom resource definitions into your environment, right? Unlike some other some other tools where you're getting 30 plus uh, new new custom types in order to manage that environment. Um, you know, keep that keep that barrier to entry low so that you get the the right choices and 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 again keep things simple. Any questions? Uh, so again, security audit. Yes, this is the, this is the 2019 audit, uh, but it was really flattering. So we like to call out a couple quotes uh, from that from that audit, right? Uh, including including their statement that we had really atypically uh, well done code that was uh, that was uh, built 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 in an extremely good way, uh, very readable and very well documented, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about going to talk about the last two kind of major releases. So we had Linkerd 2.8, uh, which brought in brought in our multi-cluster functionality that allows you to span apps between between clusters, um, which is pretty nice, right? You get you get a common trust route uh, between your between your clusters, and allows you to do things like put PCI workloads on one cluster, non-PCI on another. Or you know, take an app and span it between two geographic locations so that you don't have a single point of failure. Um, it just works over the internet, so you don't need you don't need special networking requirements to make it work, right? And and again, we're taking advantage of in Kubernetes objects. So so for your applications, they don't know that they're working with a multi-cluster service. They're just calling to a standard Kubernetes service, you know, that ends up getting mirrored over to another cluster. Uh, we're not going to demo anything for multi-cluster today, but we're going to come back and do a deep dive and happy to do multi-cluster, the Helm install, kind of whatever, whatever is interesting to this audience. Um, Linkerd 2.9 brought MTLS to standard TCP connections, not just, uh, not just HTTP connections. Uh, also brought in ARM support. So if you're using, you know, AWS, uh, ARM on AWS, or if you're building on, uh, Raspberry Pis or other edge devices, you can install Linkerd natively. Also, this is where we got the multi-core proxy. So originally, the proxy was written to only use one core at a time, but in order to in order to to keep up with any additional demands that come on it, we we made it multi-core. Um, then also allowed you to allowed you to take take instead of using the built-in Prometheus, use your own Prometheus, which is kind of nice. Um, any questions before I go on? Uh, could you talk about UDP as we have various traffic uh, that comes with that transport like SNMP? Um, I guess, Rajesh, it, it kind of depends. Like, um, like I, I guess I'm not really set up to do a deep dive in anything, anything UDP. But if you like, we can do that on our deep dive session. Okay, cool. Um, Linkerd versus Istio, kind of the elephant in the room for us because Istio is such a, a popular service mesh. Just want to talk about why we think Linkerd is a good choice and when, right? So, so Istio is is a really like there's a ton of features in Istio, right? And it and it brings you a lot of value. Um, it's it's extremely well known, and if you want to do things like uh, 
you know, have your, your proxy handle, you know, authentication and authorization and integrate with OPA and throw on some spiffy inspire, right? Like that's the, that's the, the tool for you. Uh, you know, generally we think that it's somewhat complex and, and comes with a heavy operational burden. Uh, Linkerd, right? Our, our goal here is, is simple, fast, and secure, right? Uh, it's, it's very lightweight, it's very small, it's very fast, it's very secure, and it's really easy to get going with, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But compared to, compared to Istio, we certainly have a smaller feature set. Um, love to get y'all involved. We got some, some, uh, some tweets from folks that were really impressed with Linkerd. Uh, but again, everything's done on GitHub. It's an open source project and part of the CNCF. You can join our mailing list. We have monthly community calls that we'd love to see you folks at. Um, you know, and again, we get third party security audits. Um, yeah, demo time. Any before I, I, I go here, let me stop sharing. Your entire screen, your screen, screen one, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, can everybody see my screen? You'll see this little window here. Uh, let me move that out of the way. All right, uh, so I've got two windows up here. I'm going to do things in the <coughs> terminal for now, uh, but in a minute you're going to see some stuff pop up here in this web browser. That's why we've got this side by side. Uh, so what I want to show y'all is the process of going from zero to installed with, uh, with Linkerd, okay? Um, so let's see, it's 11.58 right now Eastern time, so let's kick this off. So I run the curl, uh, I can install Linkerd and I pipe it over to, to my shell. And now I've, got my, now I've got my install done for the original binary. I'm gonna go ahead and, and extend my path so that I've got Linkerd in the path. Um, now let's go check our version, right? So I can see that I'm currently on the, the stable 2.9.4, uh, but there's no server version because I haven't installed, is it possible to run Zoom in the terminal? <laughs> Uh, I haven't I haven't figured out how to make that work, um, you know. But my my server version isn't isn't there because I haven't installed Linkerd. But we're going to do that here in just a second. So before we do it, I actually installed a, a local in-memory cluster using K3D, which is a tool to get you uh, K3S clusters. I'm using a lot of acronyms. Uh, yeah, Rajesh, this is going to be installed inside a local Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so we're going to do a pre-check, right, just to see if my cluster can handle uh, can handle running uh, Linkerd. I get some warnings because we have some we have some uh, annotations that are uh, that are going to be deprecated in Kubernetes 1.22. Um, but we look at our status checks down here at the bottom, and we are all green. So let's keep going. Uh, type Linkerd install. Uh, Oh, zoom. oh, Jesus. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that, uh, geez, folks, that was, uh, that was a dumb one. Uh, can, can you all read my screen a little bit better? <laughs> oh, man. Sorry, folks. Uh, so let's see the Linkerd install here. Um, so when I type the Linkerd install command, it actually just outputs a bunch of YAML. So I could save this off to a file. Uh, <laughs> I could save this off to a file, and if I'm using like if I'm using Flux or if I'm using uh, Argo CD, I can just uh, I can I can mesh it with my standard GitOps flow and run through doing my my deploys and installs that way. Uh, I'm not going to use a GitOps flow here today. I'm actually just going to just going to install immediately, right? So I'm going to pipe it over to my kubectl apply and install Linkerd. Now there's a lot of talking in there, but I'm at about two minutes so far to get going. Uh, I've got my new objects, which is great, um, but like, is it is it ready? So we've got this command Linkerd check, which will tell us, you know, is Linkerd ready to go? So this is a nice one if you're scripting out your install for whatever reason, you can you can run Linkerd check to to block your script and ensure that that it waits until Linkerd really is good to go. So we're going to see this this thing initializing. 
Uh, I've got another terminal that I can pull over and ideally increase the size of the screen. So I could do, you know, kget pods dash m maker d. Uh, I can see that I've got some pods up, but we're not we're not fully running. Let me increase the screen size here. There we go. Uh, great time for questions, by the way, because we're waiting on this thing to finish. All right, status checks are green. So our Linkerd environment is up and running. If at any point you're looking for this, this outputs also as, as JSON uh, so that you can consume that, that information programmatically. And you can run it anytime you've got Linkerd uh, in a cluster. I'm going to go ahead and launch a dashboard. Right, because what I'm going to show you is how we're going to get information about our environment, both from the CLI as well as from the uh, the web page here. And of course, you got launched in the wrong browser. Uh, so this is the Linkerd2 uh, graphical interface. So we've got the ability to look around at different namespaces, you know, see what's out there. I've got uh, I've got some pods in the cube system, which I'm deliberately not adding to the mesh. Right? Don't add the kube system to the to the Linkerd or to your service mesh, but I've got the Linkerd environment as well. Um, so let's take a peek. Right? So let's go into the environment. I've got this cool uh, call like an octopus graph where you can see the different pods, who's talking to what. At the core, we have we have Prometheus, uh, which is talking to all our various pods so that it can get it can get information. Now, just to talk about an important point here. Uh, that data plane we have for, uh, let me finish this sentence and then I'm going to answer for Jeff's question. The data plane that we have for your applications inside this mesh also extends to, uh, to Linkerd itself, right? So I can, I can get a look at all the deployments in the Linkerd namespace and get those golden metrics, right? See what's my success rate, what's my latency by the, by the latency bucket, as well as get a quick view of Grafana. Uh, to answer Rajesh's question, yes, you can use an existing Prometheus. That actually came in, I think, 2.9. Um, so absolutely. Um, you know, I've got uh, I've got this view of of my deployments here from from the dashboard. I can go look at a particular deployment, so I can look at my web deployment, and I can start seeing, hey, what calls are going into this application and what are we, what are they talking about, right? And I can view that here in this GUI or say I'm in a regulated environment, I've got to go through a bastion host and I can't access it that easily. I've got a, I've got a, a thing at the CLI that I can just take a peek at, at the various calls that are going on, right? See what's moving fast, what's moving slow um, and what my success rate is. So if I've got a particular path within my app that's failing, you know, we'll be able to identify it. Uh, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and go beyond just, just the Linkerd apps itself. Uh, yeah, that is, that is pretty cool. Now, that being said, uh, so Rajesh says, uh, when you have Linkerd installed, uh, we don't need Jaeger or any other tracing. Kind of, it depends what you're doing with it, right? If you are doing Jaeger and you want that, that sort of rich data surface through Linkerd, there's a you can connect that Jaeger output to the service mesh too. So you've got you've got a couple options, but yeah, you can get some really nice lightweight tracing without any instrumentation instrumentation on your app. Um, so let's go ahead and install a sample app that we run specifically for showing off uh, Linkerd uh, and see what that does. So as I create the app, you you right away you see inside the inside the um, the web the web page here we've got a new namespace that's coming online, right? And you know obviously once the app gets up and running, we'd love to get some some metrics out of it and start using it. But as you're going to see, there's nothing there's nothing meshed, right? Um, so we don't see we don't see um, we don't see any 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 
information from this application. And that's because we haven't yet injected uh, the environment, right? So the way we handle the Linkerg injection, and, and Rajesh, you may need to remind me of your question, because I think this is where we were going to talk about it. Uh, the, way, the way we handle this is, is in one of two places we add an annotation, right? So we can put an annotation directly on the deployments and stateful sets that we want uh, integrated into the mesh, or we can, uh, we can put an annotation on the namespace that tells the Linkerd mutating webhook to go ahead and put the sidecar proxy uh, in with our application. There's actually a third way as well. You can directly put the sidecar code in your in your deployment or um, your deployment or stateful set uh, specification, but generally that's that's not well advised, right? Using the using the mutating webhook is a great way to, to get that done. So as soon as I as soon as I inject this application, and by the way, I I, I lost track of time, but we're we're at under 10 minutes before you know from nothing to a Kubernetes cluster with an app instrumented with Linkerd, right? I've got NTLS everywhere. Um, you know, I've got I've got metrics getting ready to, to surface out, right? Um, you know, I can do I can do this octopus graph and see how this is going, right? Um, really quickly and and really easily. Um, so again, I did I did this rollout and I did it directly by annotating my deployment. Um, Injector and generate manifest and use it to further. Uh, that's a good. So uh, Rajesh asks, is it possible to try with dry run mode as injector and generate manifest and use it further? So you can you can certainly do that Linkerd inject command that we had. Let me let me show you all that from the side. Um, so if we do you know k get deploy uh, from the emoji photo namespace. Uh, pipe Linkerd inject. Oops, inject. I know I'm gonna. This is why I, I type everything. Um, oh, that's why. I gotta I put a YAML here. Um, so I can see just the output. I don't have to send this right back to the API. But all I'm gonna see is this annotation get created. Linkerd inject. If I want to actually see the see the sidecar, I'm going to have to go grab the YAML from the from the object after the injector transforms it. So after that mutating webhook does its work, does that make sense? Like just in in general, we're just like I, I don't know of a use case where where like actually editing your deployment to to put the sidecar in yourself is better than using the uh, using that mutating webhook. But happy to hear about it, and I'm going to give you all some channels for for getting in contact with the Linkerd folks after this, and and hopefully if you do have a use case, you can you can tell us about it. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, had a had a bit of a diversion. So we we've, we've injected our application. If we want to validate that things are doing good and we're not looking at the user interface, I can go in and run a Linkerd check and specifically ask about about the proxy for the emoji photo namespace, and we see that. We see that it is indeed running, right? And that our, our status or checks status checks returned well. And we can obviously also see that from the from the GUI here. Um, speaking of which, right, if we want to look at these deployments, right, get this view uh, that we're used to here, we can one, we can hop into Grafana and see, you know, on any given service, you know, the built-in, the built-in metrics for that, uh, for that application. Um, you know, it's not very old, right? Um, we can go to last. Uh, I'm not going to actually have it going small than that. So let me let me come back once this has got a bit more data in it. Uh, but that's going to stay there historically. And and again, if you're using a different Prometheus instance, you'll still get that that same view. Uh, but we can do a watch on those stats. So this is why oh, this is why I wanted a little bit smaller. Give me just one sec. Um, I'll I'll resize it here in a second, but you can see the same the same data pretty easily in your terminal. Um, yeah, you can see the same data pretty easily in your terminal, right? And this is this is just our our golden metrics for this application. 
Uh, same thing, we've got this, got this handy dandy graph that shows how it's working. So we know that traffic's flowing from VoteBot over to web, which is then talking to emoji and voting. We can also ask that directly of Linkerd edges. Um, you know, we can see that, you know, VoteBot is talking to web, web's talking to emoji, it's talking to voting, and Linkerd Prometheus is talking to everybody all the time because it wants to get, it wants to get those metrics uh, about how things are performing. That it can use not just for our, our monitoring data, but that it can use for things like, like that, um, that better, um, that better routing to our services so that we can, we can hit our pods with the lowest latency in any given service. Uh, we're coming to the end of the demo. So if there's anything particularly y'all wanna see, let me know. Uh, if we wanted to look at web, so let's let's go ahead and diagnose a little bit of our problem. So we see that web's not hitting 100%, right? And we'd like our we'd like our traffic to be uh, doing well. Sorry, I gotta I gotta kick my Linkerd dashboard here. Give me just one sec. I didn't uh, I didn't pay my tax to the demo gods before this. Um, so we've got our Linkerd dashboard. We want to take a peek at at web. Uh, we can see that that it's not hitting it's not hitting um, a very like or it's not hitting the the target we want in terms of availability. So we can actually take a look at the routes and see like what's going on, right? Um, and get some get some insight into what's happening. And if we zoom out a little bit, we'll see that that look at this uh, as we as we go to vote donut. Vote Donut seems to fail 100% of the time, right? Um, so we've we've clearly got something wrong inside of our voting service when we call this this Vote Donut path, right? Um, which is degrading the whole API vote set of calls, right? Um, cool. Well, we can also see this uh, by running our top command right here uh, from the CLI. Uh, so you know, no one's forcing you to use our user interface. And we give it time, and we're going to see Vote Donut pop up in here uh, eventually. Don't make me a liar. Yeah, there we go. There's Vote Donut. And we've still got our 0% success rate. Sound good? Make sense? Seem kind of cool? Everybody want to adopt it, bring it into production? All right. Uh, and we we can also do a tap to see some of the live traffic. Uh, all the data that you're seeing here in the terminal, right? It's got it's got our nice like uh, it's got like our standard string output or our standard terminal output. Uh, but we also have the ability to grab some of this as as JSON data directly. You know, so say say like um, say you wanted this voting info, right? So let's go back and say, all right, vote donut. Let's go tap. Right. Let's go see what's happening. Actually, get the command uh, to to tap this environment right here. Um, so I can start it and run it through the web UI, or I can just control paste. Uh, so let me throw this again. Um, so I can I can paste that command. And I can see all the calls to vote donut, uh, which is fine in that format, but it's a lot better if I want JSON data. So I've got like actual structured calls. Uh, so we can look at we can look at the actual uh, raw output, um, you know, from the proxies. You know, where did it come from? Where's it going? Has it been TLS? You know, and then what data are we actually getting in the environment? Oh, look at this! We're getting a gRPC error message. Uh, because of the way this call this call works, and that's the end of the demo. So let's go back to slides if I can find them. All right, cool. Just one sec. Uh, don't want to see anything else at the at the terminal before I go. Uh, can you see my screen? Does it say demo time? Can we see that? Uh, 
Uh, can you share the channel? Oh, I see. That's not for me. Um, <clears throat> all right. So with all that, uh, if y'all have any questions, I've got some got some resources for you. And actually, before I do that, I'm supposed to send y'all a little survey. So if anyone's interested or would be willing to willing to to comment, putting a little survey in the chat. Love to love to hear your feedback about this session. Right, so I'm fairly new to the to the buoyant team, and so I'd love to personally hear like how this went, what you liked, didn't like, and then of course as an organization, we'd love to hear about you know your thoughts on Linkerd in general. Uh, so for more information, uh, let's let's talk about how you can get started with Linkerd. So if you want to do effectively the demo I just did, uh, we've got our getting started guide over on the Linkerd page, and here is the link directly to it. Uh, so it's linkerd.io slash two slash getting started. I'm sorry, was someone speaking? Okay, so we've got our getting started guide, which walks through basically every step that I just did right there. Uh, we've got the Linkerd2 project on GitHub. You can come file issues. You know, if you're interested in contributing, we'd love to have your help. Uh, and you can come submit a pull request, get involved in discussions, see like, Hey, when is 210 really going to be it? What is that latest edge release? Um, and you can find us at github.com slash linkerd slash linkerd2. <clears throat> uh, and again, we'd love to hear from you. And speaking of hearing from you, we'd love to have you all join the linkerd2 or the linkerd Slack. Uh, we're also, like I said, we're trialing out uh, trialing at Discord. So if that's a lot better. Uh, we're likely to we're likely to have that up up as well before too long. But this is a great place to ask questions. You know, if you're already comfortable with Linkerd, we'd love to have you help answer questions. We have a program called uh, Linkerd Heroes, where every month we nominate folks that have done work in the community or in code contributions or through education, and love to love to nominate you, love to get your votes. Um, but it all kind of starts over here at our Slack channel which you can find at slack.linkerd.io. It's free to join. And like I said, we'd love to, love to have you there. Now, if all this went great and you loved it, um, you loved it. And Rajesh, honestly, that was the best possible segue I could have gotten here. Uh, Buoyant actually published a production runbook for Linkerd. So if you liked what you heard and you're interested and you want to run Linkerd in production, Right, we've got a guide to help you walk through all the steps and concerns that you need before going into production. So, you know, when you're talking about Linkerd, that base install that I did is fine for demos, but you need to add the HA flag to the Linkerd install command if you're going to run it in production. Because in production, you know, you want multiple versions of the various of the various components. As an example, you also likely want to bring your own certificate authority and and manage that in an appropriate way. Right, all that stuff is going to be covered in this production runbook guide, and you can find it at buoyant.io slash linkerd runbook. That's all I got. I would, I would love some more questions and, and you know, just to, just to expand on. Uh, so I'm, it's, it's correct we're, we're going to be planning a, a deep dive session in the next couple of weeks? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. It's going to be held in 16th of March, uh, and uh, we have sent out an email to you, everyone who joined our session today. So you definitely check out the deeper dive session here. But what today you learn is how fast and how easy it is in a Linkerd world to deploy a Kubernetes cluster and then deploy your app on top of it, having microservices running on top of Kubernetes cluster, mutual authentication turned in by default, and it's going to be really fast and very secure way of running a microservices application in in Linkerd. And it's been a, it's, I learned so many cool stuff from today's session and if you want to learn more about Linkerd, so we have a deeper dive session for you and we have done of what are the use cases for running in the production kind of scenario and we have to do send out an email for you everyone who joined my session today so definitely register for that session as well and we send out to everybody else we just hang on a second we can share to some YouTube channel or Twitter and other points. But Jason, it's a few questions that I have already prepared up. Somebody asked me via email. 
So one thing that I've learned today that if a developer is working on an app and they have filed an issue, regardless of I am trying to ask you go and fix that, I try to go and let's watch you in the donut app. So that's a particular area where these calls are failing. Let's go ahead and check that whether what are the fixing. So that's a really a pain point of having developers uh, previously that they are finding in the microservices world, there are so many tons of microservices there so if i ask them go ahead find where the issue is but in the linkerd world we are find out that's the issue in that that's particular donut app go find out what happening there so it's a very good uh, scene point there but for the one question that i have seen from the people asking that uh, a mature to atls is turned out by default but what happened to the other services that are running in a kubernetes service do they have, if they have want to talk at, they, they do have a mature TLS by default or they are uh, uh, ignored when they try to inject, uh, call the proxy in the Linkerd. Jason, I think you are muted. Just one of those days, folks. Uh, so let me restate your question to make sure that I understand it. Are you asking what happens when a non meshed service calls in to uh, to an app that's in that's in the Linkerd service mesh? Yes, definitely. Like what happens as far as that that TLS? Yes, definitely. That's it. so. So if you send if you send a request and the the proxy intercepts that request and it sees that you sent it as a non a non TLS connection, so that means no HTTPS, uh, no encryption. It's it, unless it's told otherwise, it's just going to pass you through, right, to that application. So, so you can you can come in and talk. You're just not getting the benefits of the mutual TLS. Uh, okay. And next question that other people that who are interesting in like kind of a so uh, whether in the traffic splitting and Kubernetes deployments kind of a role in so Linkerd is have to do a SMI spec as well. They have a service mesh interface and then they try to navigate or traffic in this. Can you elaborate on this point on what the uh, SMI is and how Linkerd is uh, adopting those? Uh, so you're asking a little bit about traffic splits and SMI? Yes, yes, yes. So let's let's look at let's just look at CRDs inside my inside my cluster, right? Uh, so we've got a couple that come from come from being part of this K3D project. But if we look at you know Linkerd ones, right? So grep, oops, I'm gonna spell it right, uh, Linkerd, right? Oh, no, that doesn't work. Uh, here we'll do grep dash v cattle. We're just gonna ignore the cattle ones because we don't care. We've got two uh, two custom resource definitions: service profiles, which allow you to take that data that you've been seeing from that that tap and that trace and those routes, and make it like way way richer, right? And uh, we can actually make that part of the deep dive as well. But you can take uh, you can take your um, your Swagger spec, your Swagger doc, and just convert it into like a full a full detail of your API that the that the service mesh can look at. Same thing if you're using gRPC, we can look at your at your actual protobuf file and 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 totally explore and expose metrics about your API itself. So that wasn't an answer to your question. Let me go over to that first. I just want to talk about it since I'm I'm here. Um, so the SMI specification is part of the service mesh interface. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, right, you've probably heard of the Kubernetes network interface or CNI or a container network interface. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry. Uh, or CSI, the storage interface. Um, those are the only, only ones that I can think of. Oh, and obviously the, the CRI, the runtime interface, right? But it's, it's just a common interface that a number of folks that are doing that bit of technology implement so that they can share features in a, in a universal way. Right. So a traffic split is an example of that SMI specification, which is attempting to take to do for service meshes what CNI did for um, what CNI did for um, network interfaces. Right. Um, so a traffic split is is one object that the SMI spec talks about, and it basically just allows you to, like we said, split traffic between services. So you can you can route some percentage from one place to another. That, does that answer your question well? Yes, definitely. Uh, it, that's okay. 
Another cool feature that you showed us here is the Linkerd tab functionality that is, I think, missing in other service meshes there. So can you elaborate more about what the tab does is and why, in which cases, you want to use that Linkerd tab? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So let me just turn back on my dashboard here. Always it goes to the wrong tab. I'm just, I've got terrible luck with this. Uh, all right, so so tap is really like, I wanna get at some of the traffic that's happening in this environment, right? So let's check out, let's check out voting, right? Because voting is actually my, my problem child, right? Like tap, uh, tap is the ability, um, tap is the ability to actually look at, look at some of these, these calls. So the actual, the actual HTTP traffic between, or in this case, gRPC traffic between uh, between these environments, and just uh, just see the actual live calls. Um, so it, it's really just recording. It is recording the interactions between uh, between the environments uh, and allowing you to display them. And we could say, you know, look at our posts as an example for Vote Rainbow. Um, you know, we can again we can do it. Uh, do it via the CLI or do it via the, the web interface. I probably should actually turn some of this off because um, I don't really know what the method is. Can I just clear you out? Um, let's go back here. Or stop. Uh, go back. Have I lost my dashboard now? No, okay, good. I'm good. Um, so voting map as an example, not put an HTTP method so I can actually see some traffic. Uh, or we can make it make it a bit lighter. Just look at uh, look at all these calls. Like look at any calls to the voting service. So you can see where you're going. But it's just a recording of the of the live calls between the apps. Right? Because because the proxy's in there, it's the one establishing that that encrypted connection. It's also got the ability to snoop in on everything that's going on. And it understands gRPC. And it understands uh, it understands your HTTP calls and is able to give you details about what your apps are doing. You know, we had a we had a customer, um, you know, that was they just they just published a blog with the CNCF, and they're talking about how you know one of the first things that they they'd always hear when they had an issue was you know hey listen uh, let's let's start out and blame the network or blame DNS or whatever that is right and having having that visibility that Linkerd provides. That they could show to their to their application availability teams, I would be like, no guys, like it's not or no folks, sorry, uh, it's not, it's not that it's you know you can't say it's the network because here I have here I have an example of what where your apps are misbehaving right now, right? And we can we can immediately diagnose the diagnose the issue, right? And like, hey, listen, my five other apps are fine, but your namespace is is having this issue, right? And specifically, it's this pod. Right, so what's going on, you know, with that particular pod, that that sort of thing. Answer your question. I got a bit rambly there, but no, 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 it's, no it's definitely it's a quite a really wonderful functionality because many microservices calling, let's say emoji calling to the web, web call to the front end, and front end call, might call to the database. So, so there's a whole tracing going on. So in the CLI in the Linkerd, you can tap out that this web is calling to the emoji app, and particularly it happens there, and you can for investigate the issue, what happens there, how many calls failing, what the status of those calls are, the 404 or 403. So it's good, it's very tremendous functionality of Linkerd, and many people will love those functionality. But so today we're running out of time here, but we want to it's a very good session for me. So tonight we learned that if how Linkerd fits into the service mesh ecosystem and what are the typical functionality and the, what are the features and capabilities of Linkerd we, we have right now. And we've seen a growing adoption of Linkerd from over the years right now in the cloud native ecosystem and keep companies are moving to the Linkerd as of their part of cloud native stack. And we love, and tonight we learn some very cool stuff from Jason and happy to see you again in a Linkerd deep dive session that we might have a mutual TLS and how we do some use production cases scenarios how we implement those in our next session in linkerd deep dive and that's going to be held in 16th of march in the same timing that we've done, done today so thanks jason appreciated your time appreciated your energy hope to see you in future and everybody rest of you please hang on there we send you some links to join us us and 
uh, rest of time bye bye and have a very very good uh, have a great weekend yes sir yeah see you folks thank you all so much yes sir.